All right, greetings everybody, and welcome to my uh, continued series on European history. This would be the fourth lecture, uh, roughly in that series. First lecture dealt with Europe from 1450 to 1700. Uh, the second looked at the Enlightenment, and the last lecture looked at um, the causes of, uh, of the French Revolution. And by all means, you're willing, you're capable, you're willing, you are allowed to and encouraged to watch these lectures in any order that you see fit, of course. But uh, me being such a linear sequential thinker, I, I would strongly suggest sort of trying to watch them in, in order. Uh, I ended off my last lecture dealing with the causes of uh, the French Revolution just briefly talking about the, the fundamental challenges that revolutionaries face when they take over power. Usually when revolutionaries are in the process of overthrowing the existing order, that is their primary focus, getting rid of the old. And when the old is removed, then they have to deal with the grim reality of actually figuring out how to organize a government, how to establish um, who does what, how to establish relationships with your neighbors, how to establish uh, the military, your currency, your medical system, your education system, your levels of government, so on and so on and so forth. When you have such a dramatic change in power, all those things have to be reestablished. The Russians had to deal with that in 1917, although Russia inherited a, a system in 1917 that was already well behind schedule in, 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 in development anyway, so I guess they didn't have to, uh, you know, replace anything that people were not already uh, unfamiliar with, so to speak. Um, but for the Russians, I mean, I think the thing is, is that, uh, or rather for the French, it really starts with just a burst of anger. And, and, and this anger, of course, had been brewing and brewing and brewing, and really it's the storming of the Bastille that, that triggers the events that will lead to this revolution. The other thing you have to consider, and this is certainly important for the American, the French, and the Russian revolutions, that when you win a revolution, or when you take over power, some revolutions are actually a coup d'etat. I would argue 1917 in Russia was more a coup d'etat than a revolution, but we'll talk about that another time. But when you do take over power, it's not like everybody is on the same page all of a sudden. It's not like everybody sees your vision and understands what it is that you want to do. The reality is there is always going to be people that are going to try to undermine the changes you are trying to make. That's why revolutions can be so bloody and that's why they have civil wars or revolutionary wars in the case of uh, the United States because uh, it, there is no guarantee that once you've taken power that everyone's going to be standing up and cheering for you. So it's very, very complex. You can never navigate how revolutions are going to roll out. You can never, certainly the French could never have anticipated the terror. I don't think they could have anticipated the guillotine the murder, the mayhem, the chaos, the power struggles, all those things. All people knew in 1789 was that they were starving, they were angry, they were dying for a reset on their uh, system and on their economy. So the French Revolution in many ways is really sets the stage for the 19th century because it becomes a source of inspiration uh, despite the mayhem of 1789 to 1799 it's really at the end of the day it's the it's the decor the declaration of the rights of man and citizen that people cling to that's the document that people look to and that was what inspired people to move away from absolutism and towards some form of constitutionalism throughout the 19th century I always say that the French Revolution was to the 19th century what the Russian Revolution was to the 20th century. And what I mean by that is that while those revolutions may have failed to meet the expectations of the people in which they claim to lead, um, it was the idea behind those revolutions that became a tremendous source of inspiration. But for our purposes, we're going to be looking at, at France. And uh, I do have a lecture, by the way, on the, um, the Russian Revolution, which you could look at another time if you wanted to. So anyway, let's move on.
So, between 1789 and 1799, France experienced a revolutionary upheaval that would change the political, economic, and social structure of the country forever. And this kind of harks back to what I was saying, was that this was a complete reset, rebuild. Now, you have to consider that the French absolutist government before 1789, that system as it existed there, their economic system, their diplomatic system, their, you know, all those things were already not working. Things had fallen apart for France. They were bankrupt. They were broke. Um, there was a resistance, of course, from the nobility to pay taxes and so on and so forth. So when that revolution happens, it has to be a complete and utter change from what they had toward something new. The question is, how is that going to look? Louis XVI would have to succumb to the fervor of the revolution and the power of the National Assembly. Now the National Assembly, you will recall, and this is why I think it's important to watch the causes of the French Revolution um, lecture first, uh, the National Assembly was essentially the third estate going rogue. They were 98% of French citizens that were given one um, vote out of three even though they were comprised of 98%. The other two, the first estate dealing with the clergy, the second with the nobility, and basically the third is everybody else. So once the third estate says, look, we're going to go rogue because we are the majority, we're going to create our own assembly. That's essentially what happens here. The National Assembly becomes a body that is going to represent everybody in the third estate, the 98%. Between 1789 and 1794, the Paris mob played a leading role in the direction of the revolution and was responsible for many of the atrocities of the 1793 terror. And we're really going to get into that. The Paris mob, just the name they're given doesn't sound terribly um, benevolent. The Paris mob, you know. The problem is, is that once you get people taking power, um, they like to think that their vision is the clearest, but there are going to be people who say, no, you're, you're too radical, or you're not radical enough, or you should do this, you should do that, and then you get factionalism, and then you get civil war, and then you get chaos, and then you get murder. Um, it's... There's really no uh, template for revolutionaries. You know, here's a textbook you need to follow in, in terms of how to do things. Because every country's experience, their pre-existing economic system, their climate, their, their, uh, the function of their, of, their, of their state system, whatever it might be, is all going to determine how much this new government has to do. But it's fair to say um, you get a very, very violent power struggle in uh, France directly after the revolution. Committees sprang up in the rural and urban areas and national guards were formed against the perceived threats of the nobility. So what you get, factionalism would be a, a good word for this, that once the revolution happens, it's not like you've got a centralized group of revolutionaries that are guiding the revolution all the way through. What happens is you get these little groups, self-interested groups, even whether they be women or peasants or clergy or, 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 or the bourgeoisie or whatever, whatever group you want to uh, identify, um, that's who they're going to look out for. They're going to look out for themselves. They're going to look out for their social class. They're going to look out for their neighbors and so on and so forth. So you get these committees springing up. And they're not all necessarily going to agree with each other. So right away, you're, you're beginning to see factionalism uh, develop in France. Revolutionary groups swept through the urban areas, and by July 1789, violence erupted in the countryside against the old seigneurial system. When you get to the countryside, you are dealing with peasants. And we talk quite a bit about peasant life in my causes of uh, lecture. Um, their life was hard, and their life, of course, was determined by the seasons. It was regulated by the rain, <laughs> by drought, uh, because they, uh, their, the quality of their life was going to be determined by whether they had food or not. 
Um, so their interests are going to be more immediate when it comes to food. In, 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 in fact, their bread riots, which are what really gets it, get this revolution going, similar to Russia in, seven, in 1917. That when people are hungry and starving, that's when they're willing to pick up a, a weapon and move forward. You know, at the end of the day, most French citizens, like any other society in Europe or in the world at the time, were people that just wanted to take care of their family, live their lives, and be happy and healthy. When you don't have the basic needs to survive, food, bread in this case, those are the things that drive people to violence, hunger, right, desperation, poverty, hardship, all those things. So, violence the violence that erupts in the countryside against the old seigneurial system is, is different than the violence in the city. Uh, what the commonality that they have is their hunger. You know, do you think peasants were reading Rousseau and, and Voltaire and, and Montesquieu and were inspired by the Enlightenment? Of course they weren't. They were illiterate. You know, their needs were more, more uh, primal, if you will, more more immediate, more, more basic, but just as important as people who were guided by the principles of Rousseau and they, they, they wanted to build this great new society similar to what they'd seen their American uh, brothers do 13 years before. So of course that was a huge inspiration. So you know you get varying, um, there's significant differences in what people needed or what they felt they needed from the revolution depending on you know what aspect of society they were in. All right, let's see, okay, well people began to demand cheaper bread and the suspension of feudal dues. What really tied peasants down was the taxes, the tithe, we talked about that in my last lecture, taxes they had to pay to the church, um, uh, they had to do a certain amount of um, labor per year, I can't remember the figure or how many hours or days I have to look back, but, but it just seemed that the peasants were constantly having to pay dues through labor or tax or money. And they were the ones who, who had the least of it, which is what makes that whole situation truly ironic. Um, when the revolution occurs, the number one issue for the peasantry, of course, was the issue of bread, the price of bread and the availability of bread. Um, so they're thinking, First of all, we want our feudal dues suspended and dropped so we don't have to pay these ridiculous things and, and I think that's a reasonable demand and we want uh, bread that we can afford. Manor houses were attacked, aristocratic property was seized and feudal records were destroyed. Okay, so what you begin to see in the countryside is this swelling cauldron of anger. And the knowledge of the revolution having happened gives the peasants, a lot of them, the um, inspiration and the confidence to say, well, boy, we're going we're gonna to pay back uh, everybody who's been keeping us down. So we're going to go to our manorial lord's home. We're going to burn it down or we're going to take it over. Uh, we're going to drag out the, the manorial lord and hang him by a rope. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of them were really, really focused on getting access to those feudal records that tied them specifically to that lord and to that property. So eliminate any evidence of their feudal dues or feudal, feudal ties, if you will, and then they can begin a new life. So once again, the, the, the revolution in the countryside is much more about um, food, about getting revenge on those that they felt had kept them down and kept them under their thumb for generations. Grain supplies were attacked and seized by hungry and angry peasants, right? Okay, once again, coming up back to that idea of those were their immediate needs was the bread. They wanted the bread. I mean, a lot of these peasants, as we said in my previous lecture, have big families. They got children. And at the end of the day, uh, what's most important to you is the well-being of your family, and uh, if, 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 if you are denied the basic sustenance or substance to keep you alive, i.e. bread, uh, you're going to do what you can to get it, and that's where things really begin to get complicated. The hysteria spread across the country through August of 1789, but gradually burned itself out 
as militias imposed law and order. So now, you know, the power center of the, of the revolutionary government is in Paris. France is a big country. And, and the idea of micromanaging all these provinces is very, very difficult because how people in these provinces are responding to the revolution is going to depend on their own situation, their own, you know, if you've got lots of food and uh, you've, you live by a beautiful clean river and, uh, you know, you've got all the food and fresh clean water that you need to survive, how that revolution in that district is going to manifest itself very differently than in an area where there is drought and starvation. So it's it's not the kind of thing where everything just kind of happens smoothly at the same time. It's like a domino effect and, and it happens differently in different places. That is the revolution happens differently. The militias are sent out because uh, chaos is really uh, beginning to develop in the countryside and they're sent out to sort of maintain some semblance of order. All right, well, the great fear resulted in liberal members of the aristocracy through the third estate to renounce feudal privilege. Okay, so once again, um, the idea that, uh, you know, there were the people who had a degree of wealth who were in the third estate, usually the self-made middle class, we didn't, we didn't call them middle class yet, they were called, I guess, the bourgeoisie. Oftentimes these are lawyers or doctors or they are shoemakers or candlestick makers or bakers or blacksmiths. People that work hard, that have a trade, that earn good money and provide a good service. There was a sense amongst many of these uh, independent, relatively economically stable and oftentimes well-educated individuals who said, you know what? Yeah, the feudal dues, they got to go. I mean, we they, they, there are things that they would completely agree with in relation to the peasantry. However, this recognition did not mean that the aristocrats renounced their property and the rent they drew an income from. You know, the aristocrats are, are on a bit of a, it's a fine line. We support the peasantry in having their feudal dues renounced, but don't mess with my property. You know, this is this is my property. I will support these guys over here in, in principle, but I don't want you coming and taking what's mine. You know, and 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 that's that's where things get difficult. You know, who owns what? And why do you own that? Did you earn it or did you inherit it? So on and so on and so forth. So, as a result, it was decided that taxes would henceforth be paid proportionate to income. All right and other aristocratic privileges would be eliminated. Okay, so now you are going to see the nobility paying taxes, whether they liked it or not. Even the more progressive nobles, if you will, were going to have to pay taxes, but it was going to be determined, the amount of tax they paid was going to be determined by their income. So, not unreasonable. In addition, the church would cease to collect the tithe, but rent would still be paid to live on church land. Okay, so the church now would stop collecting that tax, which I, I can't, I seem to recall it might have been 10% of their income. I'd have to go back, but either way, it was a fairly significant tax, and it would have to, um, uh, it would no longer be collected, but they'd still have to pay uh, to live on the land. Right, and uh, so you know, I mean, these are the early days of, of the revolution, and things are kind of being negotiated and improvised, you know. And I think oftentimes, if you get a hundred peasants with torches and pick, pitchforks approaching your manorial estate, you're going to be pretty conciliatory. If they want this, you're going to say, Well, sure, okay. Uh, the threat of violence can, uh, <laughs> can encourage people to do all kinds of things, so even. Uh, give up your property if, if it's going to save your life. For the most part, peasants stopped paying feudal dues and order was restored in the countryside. So there was this tug and pull back and forth and eventually there are compromises. And I think honestly what it comes down to is the nobles had to realize that they had to compromise. They had been uncompromising throughout the whole period when uh, the issue of taxation was at the front and center of debates and discussions in the mid-1780s. Uh, 
And I think they realize that, you know, if they want to maintain a life and a home and, and so on and so forth, that they're simply going to have to pay taxes and they're going to have to compromise to the changes. Peasant rebellion ceased, except in Brittany, where there was opposition to the revolution, and Vendy, where they opposed conscription. So once again, you are going to see the revolution and its acceptance or people's resistance to it dependent upon their individual and community situation as it is. Uh, and this harks back to the idea where I said that just because some revolutionaries took power in Paris doesn't mean that everybody in all the provinces all over uh, from Toulon in the south to you know Normandy in the north are suddenly going to be on the same page. I mean everybody's going to have their own concerns and their own demands. So. All right, well, you know, of all the things that we look back to the French Revolution for, um, the lasting, lasting thing is this incredible document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. It continues, and citizen after that. You know, everything that goes haywire, everything that goes wrong, all the mistakes that are made, all the people that are killed, the one lasting thing of this revolution really is this. And, you know, this is, this is in the days when the revolutionaries in the very beginning stages were filled with optimism, were fueled by the Enlightenment and the ideas of Rousseau and Montesquieu and many, many others. So it is very, a very, very important part of the revolution. And... Um, so, by August 26, 1789, a declaration was written for the people, setting in place the laws and principles of the new state, which echoed the sentiments of the Enlightenment, the English Bill of Rights, I believe 1689, and the American Declaration of Independence, right? So the French had the advantage of being the third major document written heading towards what we would consider today our fundamental values of democracy. So, uh, and in fact, the English Bill of Rights, I guess, would be the, really the first major one. Magna Carta, you can go way back, of course, but really, in the modern era, it would be that, that um, English Bill of Rights. And then the American Declaration of Independence is still regarded by many as the greatest, uh, uh, you know, the framework of democratic constitutionalism, but uh, once again, we can argue, debate, and discuss that another time. It asserted political and social equality, sovereignty, and the natural rights to liberty, property, security, and resistance up to opposition. Okay, I want to clarify something here. This is very important. The rights to liberty. Now we got to define that. Property. Okay, so this was not by any means a Marxist type of revolution, security and resistance to opposition. I would say of all the things in that string of words, it's really property that, you know, the Marxists, if you will, or the left have argued that the French Revolution didn't go too far, that it became a middle class, a revolution of the emergent bourgeoisie. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get that, sure. Uh, did, the, did the peasants lose out completely? Not entirely, no. There were a lot of positive changes made for the peasants, but certainly the mid-19th century Marxists would say, well, the revolution was heading in the right direction, but, you know, it didn't go far enough in taking complete control of all property to ensure uh, real equality. But we'll leave that up to the Marxists uh, to debate and discuss for now. Uh, taxes were raised by consent of the people. Okay. Um, so they had to come up with a new voting system, which they do. That three estate system has to go. Old privileges of the aristocracy were abolished. And state power would become pervasive. Okay. This is where we see the beginnings of a, for lack of a better term, a police state. That is, in order for the central government to ensure that their constitutional demands, if you will, are, are um, made available to everybody in France, you have to go out into the countryside all over France and enforce what it is you want to do, whether people like it or not. Now, for the most part, when people hear this language, there's a lot of positive um, connotation to these words. People accepted it. But 
The peasantry doesn't really get much out of this, really, at the end of the day. But despite that fact, it is still one of the great uh, current documents of the, um, of the modern era, right? And you have to consider that in the stages of, of, of democratic constitutions, you've got, you've got you know, this, this progress and, or this progression. And, uh, you know, even today when, when young nations are, are, are moving towards constitutionalism, where do they go? What do they look to? They look to the American Declaration of Independence, the English Bill of Rights, and the, and the French uh, Rights of Men and Citizens. So those three documents tend to be sort of the primary sources to aid and abet young non-republics move towards being republics, if you will. So. The king resented the egalitarian nature of the declaration and refused to sign it. There's a shocker. Um, he would move to assemble troops to retain his position as ruler by divine right. This is where poor Louis XVI makes a tremendous mistake. I mean, he could have found himself in a constitutional role as a figurehead, if you will, much like the transition that occurred in, in uh, England. Um, but he was too stubborn and he was too much emboldened by this idea that he was a king by divine rights. So um, I think he, uh, he didn't see the writing on the wall. And you know, in, for that, I would say Louis XVI is a tragic figure. Now keep in mind, I do talk about Louis quite a bit in previous lectures, but you know, he wasn't a bad guy. He was relatively shy, introverted, um, much like Tsar Nicholas II, actually in Russia before 1917. Really interesting uh, similarities between those two revolutions in so many ways, but um, you know, he, he could only rule by what he knew and what he'd learned and what he'd been taught. So, you know, here he is thinking he is the king by divine right, God-given, uh, you know, um, uh, rights. Um, and he just simply wasn't willing to share power or to play second fiddle to this new constitution. So, very, very difficult uh, decision for him to make, but I don't think he was, he was um, capable of doing it, frankly. All right, so in this late summer, 1789, rumors swirled in urban and uh, rural areas, urban and rural areas rather, that aristocrats were plotting to deprive peasants of bread. Okay, so many citizens ransacked storehouses and manors to take the grain for themselves. Okay, rumor, boy, rumor spreads like wildfire during this time. And a lot of it is just that rumor. You know, is there um, legitimacy to the idea that the aristocrats were plotting to deprive peasants of bread? Certainly there could have been, especially if they themselves were short of bread then they would do everything they could within their social status to ensure that they had bread at the expense of everybody else, including, of course, the peasants. Really, as I coming back to the idea, the bread shortages are what really fuel the violence of the revolution because that's when people, good, hardworking people who have never raised a fist in their life are driven to violence because of hunger. You know, uh, that's, uh, at the end of the day, that's what pushes people to violence. While 1789 was a good harvest that year, there were major problems with distribution as in October when women arrived at markets with crying children to buy bread to find none was there. My gosh, there could be, I can't imagine there could be anything more difficult than being a parent and watching your children weep out of hunger. You will do anything. You will maim, kill, slaughter. And it sounds terrible. It sounds like something out of Lord of the Flies. And it probably, well, revolutions are <laughs> something out of William Golding's Lord of the Flies. But I mean, at the end of the day, um, if you need food to survive, you are going to do what you can to get it. And, and this leads to, um, I believe, the Women's March, it's called, later. An officer suggested to the women marched to the Palace of Versailles to demand bread from or to Louis XVI, which effectively dispersed an unruly crowd. So the officer sees the writing on the wall that there's a swirling cauldron, and he wants to take that anger, move it out of this vicinity and say, why don't you go to Versailles? You've got a very legitimate case about needing bread. Take it to the king. So as the, this women's group 
with babies in hand and toddlers in tow, head towards the Palace of Versailles, people are watching and they begin to, it becomes a groundswell because other women are coming and going, hey, what are you guys doing? Well, we're going to Versailles to demand to the king that we need bread. Why don't you come along? You hungry? Darn straight. I could use a loaf of bread. Let's go. Don't let it be. <laughs> uh, he suggested it was that simple, but, but that's how things develop, right? That, that people come out and everyone's in the same situation. Everybody's hungry. And by the time they get to Versailles, and the crowd's pretty big, and I think the, the monarchy was, was terrified of, of this unruly mob, if you will. As they marched to Versailles, their number swelled to 6,000. There's the number precisely, well not precisely, but roughly. And upon arrival, they demanded the king and family return to Paris to later be held captive. It was a grave mistake for the monarchy. So this mob convinced the, well, they didn't really have a choice. From my understanding, I've read different versions of those events. You know, that there's stories that some of these women, you know, went into Versailles and were destroying things and burning things and wrecking things. And I can only imagine the monarchy would have been absolutely terrified. I don't think they had much of a choice. I don't think you could hide under a bed long enough to, uh, to keep hidden. So I think, you know, once this mob says, you are going to Paris, they just said, okay, fine, you know, we're going to go. Uh, they didn't have a choice, as far as I can tell. All right, wow, well, so much, so much that needs to happen. The nationalization of church land, the chaos of 1789, saw no system in place to collect taxes and expenses mounted. Okay, right, and this was because their financial system was already in a state of chaos and, and bankrupt. In, even before the revolution anyway. The assembly argued for seizing church land, which was about 10% of France's land, to direct the revenue into state coffers. Okay. So the thinking was the Catholic Church of France has had a good run for years and, and, and they are controlled and administered by a foreigner, if you will, the Pope in Rome, and that land should now be under uh, the control of France, and from that 10%, a significant amount of revenues could be could be um, called, if you will, for through taxation, through uh, agriculture, whatever it might be. The civil constitution of the clergy of 1790 would see them fall under state control. Now you can imagine. The Catholic Church in France was mortified about this, and certainly when word gets back to Rome. Uh, they're very, very angry about circumstances. Clergy would be elected by citizens and paid by the government and expected to swear an oath to the government over the Pope. Here you go, okay. Power to the people, as you would say. So if you were going to be a new uh, clergy, a, a new minister, if you will, in, in a Catholic church in, in France, you would have to be elected by the people in which in the community with which you claim to represent. You would be you would be a government servant, so you'd be paid by the government. Therefore, you, therefore, rather, you would have to abide by national rules regarding governance and regarding responsibility. Um, but having to swear an oath to the government over the pope was very very hard for a lot of these uh, uh, priests to to do. More than half refused the oath, and the conflict between the church and the state became more prevalent. So you begin to see a split. Some people saw the writing on the wall and said, hey, what's the big deal? I'll sign a little the oath that the new nation of France, and I keep my job, keep my home, keep, keep, keep my friends in the community. So, all right, here you can see now, I don't know how well you can see this. What you can see here is just all these different colors. <laughs> I don't know how well, it's probably pretty fuzzy from your vantage point, but these are all the provinces, the, the, the districts, if you will. So you have to restructure the administrative framework of France, and that's what, what they have to do. New levels of government and the judiciary uh, needed a major update as much of the absolutist bureaucracy had been eliminated or completely altered. Once again, harking back to what I said at the beginning, that you are rebuilding from scratch, right? Right. 
France was divided into 83 departments governed by elected officials. Okay, so there's 83 of those different colors there, you can see. Louis had lost any decision-making power, and in 1791, on the advice of his wife, Marie Antoinette, fascinating character, Austrian princess who would marry Louis XVI, the royal family fled in disguise by carriage, but were recognized in Varennes just before they got out of the country and escorted back to Paris and later tried for treason. So, had Louis, Marie Antoinette, and their children stayed in France and tried to navigate a new life within the framework of this new France, I do believe that they could have maintained their position as monarchs, much like the situation in the United Kingdom. But they decided not to, and I think they were scared, understandably, so they decide to flee. And when they decide to flee, they get in a carriage dressed as commoners, somebody recognizes them, and Varenz isn't far from the border uh, outside of the country, and they are discovered and brought back. At that point, they are uh, convicted of treason, betraying their own country, trying to leave their own country. As a result, the king continued to lose power, and with the introduction of legislative, the executive, and judicial levels of government, the king was required to uphold the new constitution. He simply didn't have a choice. He could resist all he wanted, but once again, I think he saw the writing on the wall. And, you know, what I don't think he could anticipate that was that when he was, his family was returned back to Paris after their attempt to flee, um, that they could possibly be executed as a result, but we'll get to that shortly. The legislature saw 745 elected deputies, but no majority. The moderates in the center, the Jacobins on the left, and the Girondists on the right. Okay, now the Jacobins are the, the radicals, that is, they're the, they're the hardcore revolutionaries that are willing to take any action necessary. The Girondists were the moderate, well, more moderate than the moderates. Um, they wanted to compromise with the monarchy. They wanted to do things in a less violent way. They wanted to reach more consensus, compromise. Um, they believed in the revolution. They believed in the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. But they had a very, very different path. And, you know, when you get to the French legislature and you, you know, on the left side of the, of the legislature were the Girondists or the or the Jacobins, rather, the left wing, and then the Girondists were on the right, the right wing. The term left wing, right wing, comes out of the French Revolution, and that's where we have adopted those terms. All right. Well, as if trying to establish civil stability isn't enough, all the other major European powers are terrified of this revolution. They're terrified of what it could represent to their own place as absolutists in their own countries. It's not unreasonable to think that royalist families and absolutist monarchies throughout Europe see in the French Revolution a great inspiration for people in their own countries. So they have got to get in there and douse that fire before it spreads. And that's where, you know, the idea of using revolutionary ideas as a spreading, much like communism in the 20th century, we use the idea of the spread of communism like it was a bacteria that if you didn't inject it with a good dose of antibiotic, it's just going to keep spreading. The spreading of communism needed to be, needed to be held in check so it's not surprising that the other nations of Europe are mortified by what they're seeing in France. So France would declare war on Austria in April 1792 and only survived a defeat because Austria was distracted with Russian interference in the partition of Poland. So there's a lot of other things going on. I mean, Germany, for example, wasn't Germany yet. It, it was, um, you know, what was it called? Oh my gosh, the Holy Roman Empire, right? Um, and later when Napoleon carves it up and, and, and breaks it up into sections, it becomes the Confederation of the Rhine. Germany does not really become unified national imperial Germany in its final stage until 1871. So 
you know, uh, but and on the other side you have Poland who's doing battle with the, you know, they've had a very difficult past, of course, with the Russians. So there's a lot going on in Europe that, uh, for France, worked to their advantage. By the summer of 1792, the war had created desperate conditions in France, and all anger turned against the king. Well, three years into the revolution, there have been progress. You've got a constitution. You've got the, 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 uh, the reduction of feudal dues. You've got uh, people paying taxes who hadn't before. But you've got to re keep in mind that the, the revolution inherited an economy that was already bankrupt. And, uh, and that's not going to get any better overnight just by th overthrowing the government. So um, the more that the happiness in people's lives are delayed by struggle and, and, and political infighting and everything else, people are beginning to really vent and turn their anger toward the king. Hysteria, paranoia, and fear grip the country as rumors of foreign interference swell. Now this is the interesting thing is a lot of the violence that really, really comes to the fore by 1793 is a result of the idea that the revolutionaries needed to stomp out anti-revolutionary forces that may be aided and abetted by monarchist royalist forces outside France. The threat of foreign invasion on France gave a pretense to the revolutionaries to, to kind of declare, if you will, martial law. And what you see happening is that, you know, who can you trust? Who's for the revolution? Who's against it? Who's just pretending to be a revolutionary? But who's really seeking to undermine it? And when you get that kind of thinking and that cauldron of fear and distrust and everybody afraid of having the finger pointed at them, you get the great terror and you get the guillotine after. So, 1,100 prisoners were killed in mob violence under the guise of preserving the Republic. So now you are seeing people being murdered in defense of the Republic. This violence was a prelude to the terror a year later where the guillotine would become front and center of mob violence and coercion through fear. All right, well, despite the foreign wars, despite the chaos, the revolutionary government has to continue to move forward in trying to build a stable, um, progressive uh, republic, if you will. This new convention, the National Convention, was formed out of the dissolution of the Legislative Assembly in 1792 with its first act to abolish the monarchy and to become officially a republic. In foreign policy, the convention advocated support for revolution in other absolutist states in favor of liberty and equality. Now, once they start professing that, what do you think the other uh, absolutist nations are going to do, right? I mean, it's much like inter the Communist International in, in Russia after 1917. They claim that they're going to be the bastion of communist uh, guidance and therefore they're going to encourage communism everywhere in the world. I mean it just created very similar sets of circumstances in those two scenarios. The Girondists favored decentralization, respect for private property and opposing foreign wars. Decentralization, the idea that we don't need the government to have such a strong um, control over every aspect of people's lives. We can kind of loosen those things up a bit, have faith in the people's ability to do the right thing, and so on and so forth. The Jacobins, led by uh, Maxim Robespierre, Murat, and Danton, of course he will be the key of the three, favored a centralized government and prepared to abandon private property over communal holdings. So now you're seeing the more radical element moving toward more towards the kind of thing that um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau would have talked about, because uh, he was, of course, the more ideologically left-wing, if you will, of all the enlightened thinkers. So they're really pushing towards that kind of thing. Regarding the king, the Jacobins wanted execution and the Girondists clemency. But after six weeks of debate, the vote favored execution in January 1793. Many radicals resented the Girondists, and the revolution took a ruthless turn. Now you've got these two groups fighting 
about policy, about procedure, about what's right and what's wrong, both of whom claim that they are interpreting the Declaration of Rights and Man and Citizen correctly. And uh, the Jacobins, I think, because they're more ruthless, because they're more bloodthirsty and more willing to enforce violence to ensure their, their um, ideas are implemented, uh, the Girondists fell, really, were not able to hold on to things under that kind of um, strength that um, the Jacobins had. And the Jacobins also had Robespierre, who was a lawyer, by the way, a trained lawyer, a great orator, um, who really begins to steer this revolution. And, and unfortunately, leadership is what the revolution needed, but they probably didn't need Robespierre, unfortunately. He was the wrong guy, and I'll explain shortly why that was the case. By the summer of 1793, the, uh, France was at war with Britain and all the other European powers except Russia, and food shortages were rampant. So now, now they're basically encircled by European powers all around them who want to douse this revolutionary fire. And in addition to that, France is dealing with shortages of bread. I mean, they are in an impossible situation. And what happens is, as things become more tense, in foreign policy, the, that manifests itself in greater repression, violence, finger pointing um, internally, right? Are you with us or are you against us? And all it took was an accusation and you were done for, right? This is like Stalin's purges, like, you, 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 you know, you, you, you simply, you get accused of being a counter-revolutionary by somebody uh, and that could be enough to get your head uh, removed by guillotine. The Committee of Public Safety, interesting name of this organization, was formed to tightly centralize power and decision making in a body of 12 men with Robespierre at the front. Aha, the Committee of Public Safety. Sounds good. Love the name. Makes you feel like, okay, we're going to be looked after now. Well, unfortunately, the Committee of Public, public Safety um, does almost the complete opposite of what you would think it should be doing. The first act was to deal with internal enemies, aha, the enemy within. Perceived and real, unleashing the reign of terror where 20,000 people were guillotined for mere suspicion of treachery. Mere suspicion. The guillotine came into effect because it was seen as a more humane way of putting people to death. The days of drowning people or shooting people or putting them on a stretcher or tarring, and, not tarring and feather, but quartering them, whatever grotesque way uh, European powers had of killing their citizenry, the thinking was, well, hey, it's quick and easy. And, uh, you know, you, you just think, they, they called it, by the way, the French, the nickname for the guillotine was the National Razor. And what ends up happening is this thing comes out into the center of Paris, and I believe there's guillotines outside Paris as well, but the main death toll, I think, amounted from Paris. It becomes like a grotesque mob mentality where people would come out to watch these beheadings and it would certainly terrify you and disgust you, but in a way it became addictive to people to, to watch this, this horror show. The thinking also with the guillotine from the perspective of the Jacobins for the Committee of Public Safety was the idea that, well, if people see what the consequence is of their uh, lack of conformity, um, we might reduce uh, resistance to our regime if people know their heads are going to be chopped off. Um, so it's a pretty intense, horrible situation. And I gotta tell you now, just a quick segue, I had many years ago a student put up his hand and he said to me, he said, Mr. Tolman, when somebody gets their head chopped off, do they feel their head land in the basket? And are they able to see the guillotine for a few seconds before their lights go out? And <laughs> it, was, it was a great, I mean, it's a great question. But I was so struck by the question that my answer, which was a quick knee-jerk reaction, was, well, I said, well, there's really only one way to find out. <laughs>
and then the class was quiet, and then they all burst out laughing. Um, I believe there have been studies. I think it's like four seconds. I don't know. And I don't really know how you can prove that. I don't know how science can prove that. I like to think that you can know these things, but uh, at the end of the day, I think the only way to find out uh, if you are able to see anything for even a millisecond is to go through that process yourself. So I don't think there's going to be many volunteers for that. Victims included members of the royal family, aristocrats, clergy, political enemies, and anyone accused of military or political treason. Once again, accused is the key word here. That's all it took. You were accused and you had your finger pointed at, you were done for. A lot of people who get put on the guillotine are people who are unfavorable in their communities. They might be seen as individuals that have been greedy or, or ill-mannered or rude or disliked by others in the community. And sometimes that's all it took. And uh, um, so, you know, if you're a good human being and you're compassionate and showed empathy for the kindness towards and goodwill towards humankind, you might be spared the guillotine. But if you had a reputation of being a malcontent and, uh, and, uh, and an abusive individual, chances are pretty good you'll find yourself on the chopping block. Well, by 1795, the revolution had gone through so many radical changes and infighting and foreign wars and, and committees and, and inf oh my gosh, I mean, people were actually, by, the 17, by 1795, people were exhausted from the turbulent years of this revolution. And by the mid-late 1790s, all vestiges of the old regime were removed and now many could rise in status out of talent as opposed to class. So one thing the revolutionaries really believe firmly in is that if you were talented and good at something, you should be awarded for that. Now this could manifest itself from a trades perspective, that, that bread, you know, bakers and blacksmiths and people who had a talent in sewing or, or whatever it might be, or tapestries, should be allowed to, and should be encouraged uh, to, to rise up. But in government, you didn't need to be an aristocrat. You just needed to be somebody, probably would want to be someone who had a certain degree of education and was literate to some capacity. But you're seeing people rise into positions in government who were able to rise into those positions by talent, by, by capability. The goal was the, to, uh, to create a whole new society, including the cult of the supreme being, which I'll explain which was an attempt to destroy Christianity, but the people did not support the idea. This is where Robespierre goes a little bit, you know, drunk with power, you know, um, where he sees himself as sort of this supreme being and that they're going to replace Christianity with this new French revolutionary religion and with Robespierre as its leader. And most French citizens were saying during this period, mm, this doesn't feel right. This is Robespierre going off center. Now keep in mind, Robespierre was the key individual who was responsible for much of the, the terror and the murder uh, uh, that was occurring in France. And, uh, um, you know, uh, he will get, <laughs> uh, there will be consequences for Robespierre. Simplicity in clothing prevailed and powdered wigs and jewelry were cast aside. The metric system was introduced and a new revolutionary calendar was created with new names for dates and months. This was a bit crazy, you know, the idea that they're going to create their own system that is completely uncalibrated with the rest of the world. I mean, even Lenin in Russia in 1922 decided to change their calendar to, to be in synchronicity with everybody else. They had been, I think, 11 or 13 days behind uh, because they were still on the old Julian calendar when everyone else had moved towards the Gregorian calendar. Um, that's another story. But, uh, but here the French revolutionaries are creating their own completely revolutionary calendar system, completely out of sync with everybody else. Well, things began to simmer down. The Jacobins were the first state to use totalitarian methods in the name of liberty and democracy. 
After a year or ir of irrational and murderous policies, 40,000 people were killed and people began to question the leadership. Well, there's a shocker. Uh, people were not happy. It was a terrifying set of conditions to live in. Is this what the revolution was supposed to bring? For me to be in constant fear of being accused of something? Robespierre would be seen as the main cause of the violence and previous allies turned on him. In July 1794, he himself would be guillotined. What a tragic situation this was. So, Jack, so, so, so the, the guy who's like, you know, the main figure in, in, in fomenting and perpetuating the terror uh, of the revolutionary years, uh, he himself gets thrown in prison and the night before he, he, he manages, I don't know if somebody gives him a pistol so he can kill himself before he has to face the guillotine. He, he, he shoots himself in the head, but he basically shoots kind of his jaw off. Uh, not off, it's just kind of hanging. Uh, so he doesn't die in the process, so he's in excruciating pain. They tie up his head with a, with a handkerchief to keep his jaw in place, and there he goes to the guillotine, marched out with his jaw nearly shot off. Now I don't know if this is entirely true, but I do remember reading an account on the French Revolution many years ago that claimed, and once again I can't confirm this, but uh, it's an interesting idea, that the decision was made that when Robespierre was to face the guillotine, he would be the only one, by the way, as far as I know, to face the blade coming down on his own neck upwards. So I'll give you an example, when people went to the guillotine and their heads were facing down, they couldn't see the blade, they would hear it, and then whew, off would go their head. He was tipped the other way, so he would see the blade come down on his neck, and apparently as the guillotine came down, you could hear this horrible shriek, which I'm sure was partially uh, inspired by the pain he was feeling, and off came his head. Uh, so terrible situation for him. The National Convention would dismantle the system of terror and move toward moderation. Once Robespierre is executed, there is this sort of post-McCarthyism is the best way I can think of it, where everyone kind of goes, what on earth have we allowed to happen in our new young republic? And there is a move away from the radicalism of the Jacobins and the terror and a move towards greater moderation. But even moderates still had to face dealing with the economy, dealing with uh, moving forward, dealing with establishing relationship with their neighbors in Europe. In 1795, a new constitution returned power to the property classes, okay? And the new government called the Directory there's so many names, I know, you don't have to memorize, unfortunately. This one, the Directory faced insurmountable economic challenges. And until the Napoleon coup d'etat in 1799, when citizens craved economic stability and law and order. So when Napoleon comes into the picture in 1799, French citizens by the late 1790s are craving stability craving responsible leadership. In many ways, they feel like they need a firm hand. You know, people were ready for it. You know, it makes me even think of the Weimar Republic and how Hitler would, would, would come into power after that. Because in the same kind of way, people were looking for strong central leadership and guidance and moving forward. So, um, and certainly when Napoleon comes in, that is a whole other fascinating chapter of the French Revolutionary period. And uh, that will be, of course, the discussion in our next lecture, we'll be looking at the role of Napoleon Bonaparte as well. All right, once again, that being said, I find myself saying that at the end of almost all my lectures, that being said, uh, that is where we will conclude today's lecture. Uh, if you are interested in comparing and contrasting, please by all means have a look at my lecture on the Russian Revolution. And I do have one on the American Revolution, which I have yet to upload. And uh, once again, thank you very much for watching, and uh, we will see you next time. Take care.